How are we doing, Journey family? Good to see all of you here today. I want to welcome those of you who are joining us online and those of you who are Lake County. We uh, always enjoy having you with us as well. Hey, I'm just curious, um, how many of you made at least one New Year's resolution for 2024? Let's show our hands. Got some New Year's resolution people in here. I see a few people. Yeah, that's great. Forbes Research says about 40% of Americans make a New Year's resolution. So I'd look about like 40% of you raised your hands there. According to their research, here are the top five resolutions for 2024. <laughs> improved fitness, improved finances, improved mental health, lose weight, improved diet. Here's just my guess. This is probably the top five every year, wouldn't you say? But scroll down to the bottom of the chart and you'll see just above drink less alcohol is meditate regularly, which may or may not include prayer. Now, if Forbes research is accurate, it, may, it means about one in 20 Americans make a New Year's resolution to pray or meditate more often. My guess is among Christians, the percentage is probably higher. Did any of you make a resolution to pray and read scripture more in 2024? Anybody? I see a few hands there. Very good. Very good. I did as well. That was one of mine. 28 days in, so far, I'm doing great. But my other resolution, to hit the gym three times a week, I have to admit I'm not doing so good. If you're struggling to keep your resolutions, don't feel so bad. So is everyone else. In fact, failing at New Year's resolutions is so common, there's actually a name and a date for it. It's called Quitter's Day, and it's on January the 17th, <laughs> right? So we've already passed it, which means many of us have already given up, moved on, and put those resolutions to bed, right? You with me? All right, very good. But today is all about offering you a chance at redemption, an opportunity to start over or to get back on track or to make what I believe is the best New Year's resolution of all time. Because if you wanna experience all that God has for you this year, if you wanna supercharge your prayer life, if you wanna witness God working in powerful ways, if you wanna know and understand the Bible more, if you wanna see God's hand working in your family and in your church and in the world around you, then I've got exactly what you need, a New Year's resolution that will supercharge your walk with God. Now, before I tell it to you, let's do some math. How many weeks are left in 2024? That's okay, 48, I did the math, I, don't, I, I double checked, it's 48 weeks. So there's still a long way to go in 2024, that's my point. So let's say you come to church here every Sunday for the rest of the year, you never miss a single week. That would mean, among other things, of course, 48 more Sundays, which sounds like a lot, but 48 30-minute sermons translates into only about 24 hours of teaching and praying. Like one full day out of 337 days. Or to break it down even further, 24 hours out of 8,088 hours. Here's my point. If you want to grow in your relationship with God this year, 48 more Sundays will not do for you what you think it will. It just won't. If your prayer life consists only of what you do here each week, if your reading of scripture only happens here, you will not gain victory over the sin in your life. You will not see power and effectiveness in your prayer life. You will not gain much wisdom or insight into difficult situations that you're facing. You will never be able to handle with love that troublesome person at work. You will rarely hear from God and your soul will constantly feel empty and dry. Now, why do I say that? Because Sundays are great, but they're not enough. If the only spiritual nourishment you receive is what happens in a weekly worship service somewhere, as good as that is, let me warn you, you're starving yourself spiritually. 
We've got to take seriously Joshua's words to the people of God. Here's what he said. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate upon it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. So here's my challenge to you. A New Year's resolution for you. It's so basic, it's hard to believe it will do for you what nothing else will. You ready for it? Here it is. I commit myself to daily reading scripture and praying throughout the remainder of 2024. It's as simple as that. I commit myself to daily praying and reading of scripture throughout the rest of 2024. Now, should you choose to accept this challenge, you'll supercharge your devotional life by going from one time a week to seven times a week, from 48 Sundays to 337 days. If you spend just 30 minutes a day on focused prayer and scripture reading, you'll go from 24 hours total to 183 hours of quality time with God in 2024. You see, every year we see that we're bombarded. You watch TV or you on social media, whatever, we're bombarded with ads begging us to upgrade our phones, upgrade our cars to the newest models, our clothes to the latest trends. But have you ever considered upgrading your time with God? There's a reason God gave us the book of Psalms, an entire book full of prayers and praise and possibilities. It's a literal treasure chest of worship wisdom for us to tap into. And I love this quote. When you pray to God regularly, irregular things happen on a daily basis. When you pray to God regularly, meaning daily, irregular things happen on a daily basis. You should try it in 2024 and see what happens. Over the past two weeks, Pastor Dustin has helped us understand what to pray when life is going well, and then how to pray when life takes a turn for the worse. Today, I want us to look at what it means to walk with God every step of the way. And we're going to do this by exploring one of the most amazing chapters in the Old Testament, Psalm 119. It's here in this passage that the writer reminds us that walking with God every step of the way meaning, means meeting with God every day of the year. I'm going to say that again. Walking with God every step of the way means meeting with God every day of the year. Over the last few weeks, we've been encouraged to uh, invest in the 21 days of prayer. Some of you have seen this prayer card and you've taken it home, you're using it as a guide for your prayers. There's still some at the exits of the worship center and I hope that you'll pick one up. But 21 days of prayer is really just a jump start to what we all really need, which is 365 days of prayer. Because it's in the daily grind of pursuing God through praying and reading his word that we cultivate a strong and resilient faith with deep roots that enable us to withstand the good times and the bad times. I heard about this kid who said to his friend, my grandpa must be the slowest reader in the world. He said, well, why would you say that? He said, he reads his Bible every day and he's still not finished. <laughs> you know, I love the book of Psalms. It's the longest book in the Bible, 150 chapters. The content is real, it's raw, it's relatable for sure. It addresses every human emotion and points us to the God of holiness, of goodness, and it shows us his incredible love. The first word of the first verse in the book of Psalms says this. It, it sets up the tone for the whole book. It says, blessed is the person who, as if to say to the reader, keep on reading, keep on praying. What's coming is going to blow your mind, and the rest of the book really does. G. Campbell Morgan said, the book of Psalms is the book in which the emotions of the human soul find expression. Whatever your mood, I can find a psalm that will help you express it. 
And that's really true. The Psalms do touch every human emotion. Whatever you're going through, you can find a Psalm that addresses where you're at and what you're going through and how you're feeling. Today, though, we're going to look at Psalm 119. Page, uh, page 527 in the Pew Bible there, or the, the Bible there in the, in the seat rack there in front of you, if you want to turn to it, you're welcome to. Uh, page five. In, on the inside cover, too, by the way, of that Bible, there's a, re, uh, there's a Bible reading plan. Just click the QR code there with your phone, and it'll take you to our website. There's a, there's a Bible reading plan there. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the entire Bible. So Psalms is the longest book. Psalm 19 is the longest chapter in the whole Bible, 176 verses. Its length is due to its structure. In the original Hebrew language, the whole chapter is an acrostic, which means each paragraph of eight verses begins with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet, 22 paragraphs in all. I think extra effort was put into crafting it to make it memorable, to make it poetic in the original language. Some of the most well-known and most often recited verses of all time come from Psalm 119. Ones like this, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You've heard that before. Here's another one. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Here's another one from Psalm 119, very, very well known. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Here's another one. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. Today, I want us to drill down deep on the last eight verses of this chapter. All eight verses are a prayer. In fact, the whole chapter is a prayer. It's the cry of someone who feels wrecked and pleads for rescue. It's, it's one who feels lost and needs to be found, one who feels wayward and needs to come back home, one who's wandering and begging for a shepherd to come. What's expressed in these last eight verses of Psalm 119 hits home for all of us. There's not a single word that doesn't touch my life or touch your life. It begins like this. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my plea come before you. Deliver me according to your word. My lips will pour forth praise for you teach me your statutes. My tongue will sing of your word for all your commandments are right. Let your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I find this prayer fascinating. It's a guidebook. It's a, it's a, it's a prayer manual. It's like a cheat sheet for how to pray with precision and power. Notice the rhythm in the verses that we just read. Four times the writer begs God to accept his posture of worship. Let me cry, he says. Let my pleading, let my lips, let my tongue all acts of worship, every word an expression of praise, and then following the praise and only after the praise comes his request, let your hand be ready to help me. Notice he does not begin his prayer by asking for help. He begins his prayer with worship and praise. The order is significant. Even Jesus says so. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place, the Bible says. When he finished, one of his disciples came up to him. Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John taught his disciples to pray, he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. Again, Let's take note of Jesus' answer to a direct question about how we're supposed to pray. He says, honor God first when you speak to him. Hallowed is your name. Hallowed means holy. It means sanctified. Worthy, Lord, is your name. The name above all names. Praise, and here's why. Because praise precedes petition. Praise of God precedes petition of God. If you're going to petition God with requests, you praise him first. You worship him, then you petition him. So let's dig even deeper. There's something else here vital to effective, powerful prayer. Notice how the psalmist links powerful prayer 
to his love for God's word. In each verse, he pray, his praise sits on the foundation of Scripture. God's word is the building block of the whole prayer. What does this mean for you and me? It means that when we pray, there's a rhythm to prayer that honors God. And that rhythm includes praising God, worshiping God, and loving God's word. We often view pray, praying and reading the Bible as two separate spiritual disciplines, mutually exclusive of one another, with little overlap. But what if they were meant to be linked? What if prayer and scripture reading were meant to intersect, if they were, they were meant to be linked? What if God intended prayer and reading of his word to come together at the same time? What if Reading became a form of praying, and praying became a form of reading. I believe one of the main reasons we struggle day, with daily prayer is because we run out of things to say to God. Have you ever started a prayer like this? <clears throat> Dear God, and you got nothing? I mean, I've been there. Sometimes we just don't know what to pray, so we don't pray, right? Sometimes we just don't know, have anything to say. We're left with cliches or platitudes or some kind of jargon that means little to us and means nothing to God. Could it be, go with me on this, could it be that our lack of praying daily comes down to a lack of content? Like having an awkward conversation when you don't really know what to say? But it doesn't have to be this way. Why not let your Bible reading become your praying? Why not pray through Psalm 119 and all the other Psalms as well? Again, Pastor Mark Batterson says it like this, reading is the way you get through the Bible. Prayer is the way you get the Bible through you. Reading is the way you get through the Bible. Prayer is the way you get the Bible through you. You see, when you read your Bible, underline it, asterisk, circle it, highlight it, write in the margin, not only for yourself, because you learn that way, but also for those who will perhaps inherit your Bible, those who come after you someday. Bible apps are great. I mean, I have a Bible app. I think it's great, and I use it sometimes, but an app can't be a keepsake like a real Bible can. You can't pass down your Bible app. That's why I prefer a book because I can leave it to my children and my grandkids after I'm gone. One of my favorite possessions on earth is this Bible right here. This Bible belonged to my great grandfather. Um, his name was James Harvey Johnson. His middle name is where I get my middle name. He was, um, he was a preacher and this was the Bible he used and I, sometimes I use it for my devotions um, because I want, to see what, I want to see what he underlined. I want to see what he circled. I want to see what he wrote in the margin notes. One of the things I love best about this Bible is that it is, is literally falling apart. That's partly because it was printed in 1857. <laughs> but it's also because he used it a lot. Someone said a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. I think there's some truth in that statement, don't you? His Bible wasn't just well read. His Bible was well prayed. What about yours? It not only blessed his life, it's also blessing mine too. And I want my Bible to do the same for my kids and grandkids. Today, if you don't have a Bible, you might be like, that's a great idea, preacher. Where, where do I get a Bible? There's one in the seat back in front of you. Take it if you don't have a Bible. Let that become the Bible that you mark up and the Bible that you pass down, the Bible that you pray through in 2024. But the psalmist continues, and here's what he says. I long for your salvation, Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live that it may praise you. Have you ever prayed a, a prayer like that? Lord, let me live so that I can praise you. I mean, we want to live, right? But do we want to live so that we 
that our mission is to praise God. He's talking about worshiping God from the deepest part of who he is, his soul. It's like worshiping God is his life mission. He sees worship at his, as his highest calling, his deepest desire. What a prayer. He fully understands the great commandment, which is in the New Testament, where Jesus says to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul and mind. He's praying that God will let him live for this very purpose. My question is, what are you living for? What are you living for? Lots of people live for lesser things. Lots of people live for temporary things, things that do not last, things that are not eternal. Maybe you're living for your career or your kids or stacking up riches or the next vacation or the next thrill. Whatever you're living for, if it's not to worship God as the number one priority, make sure you take into account Jesus' warning. And here's what he says. Do not strive to gain the whole world and in the process, lose your soul. Maybe you don't even know what you're living for or what your purpose is or what your next step in your walk with Jesus is. Maybe you don't know. Maybe this final verse of Psalm, 170, of Psalm 119, verse 176, describes you at this very moment. It goes like this. I've wandered off like a lost sheep. Come looking for your servant, for I do not forget your commands. You see, pastor and author John Ortberg tells the story of receiving a postcard in the mail. The postcard only had six words on it. And the words were, I am the one Jesus loves. He looked at the return address and he saw that it was a friend of his and so he gave him a call. He told him that the slogan came from author and speaker Brennan Manning. At a seminar, Manning referred to Jesus' closest friend on earth, the disciple named John, the Bible says, identified in the Gospels as the one whom Jesus loved. Manning said, if the disciple John were asked, what's your primary identity in life? Like, like who are you? What's your uh, primary identity? How do you see yourself? He would not reply. John would not reply. I am a disciple. He would not reply, I am an apostle. He would not reply, I am an evangelist. He would not reply, I'm the one that wrote one of the four gospels. But rather, he would say, I am the one Jesus loved. What would it mean if you came to the place in your life where you saw your primary identity of yourself as the one Jesus loves? How differently would you see yourself at the end of the day you know, sociologists have a theory and it's referred to as the looking glass self. And the theory goes like this. It says you become what the most important person in your life thinks you are, which begs for two questions, doesn't it? Who's the most important person in your life and what do they think about you? How would your life change if you truly believed the Bible's incredible words about God's love for you? What if you looked in the mirror and you saw yourself the way God sees you? Brennan Manning tells the story of an Irish priest who was walking, was on a walking tour in a rural countryside and he sees this old peasant kneeling by the side of the road praying. Impressed, the priest says to the man, you must be very close to God. And the peasant looks up at him from his prayers, thinks for a moment, and then smiles and he says, yes, he's very fond of me. The truth is, God is crazy about you. No matter who you are, no matter where you're from, and no matter what you've done, God loves you more than you can possibly begin to even fathom. Even if you've wandered off or wandered away from the shepherd, God is at this very moment seeking you. Your presence here today is a good reminder that God wants more than anything for you to come home, for you to find salvation, not in the things of this world, but in him. It's true what the prophet Isaiah says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each one's turned to his own way. We've all left and the shepherds has, to re, has, to, has had to come after each and every one of us. Is today the day 
you turn from your way to his way? Is the day-to-day that you take your next step toward the good shepherd? The psalmist says, search for your servant, Lord. Maybe that's your prayer today as well. Lord, find me. Lord, help me. Lord, rescue me. I'm tired of running. I need your rest. Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy burden, and I will give you. And that's not a probability like, well, it might happen. That's one of those promises in scripture. There's zero doubt that Jesus is coming to rescue you, coming to save you. How can I be so sure about that? Because he says to all who will listen, he says, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The cross is where the shepherd, the son of God laid down his life for your life. And that's actually why we call him the good shepherd because he gave himself for all of us. Remember, God is the shepherd and we are the sheep. Let me close with this story. There's a um, story goes back a number of decades ago to London, England. There was this great actor stood up on a stage and a large crowd had gathered to hear him perform monologues. And so he was performing to their great delight and someone from the front row said to him, hey, will you take a request? He said, well, what's the request? And they said, will you perform for us the 23rd Psalm? He said, no, I'm not gonna do that. But they insisted. He noticed in the back of the room, there was an older gentleman, somebody well-respected, a a sage of the community, if you will. And he said, you know what? If the gentleman in the back will also come up here on the stage and recite to you from his memory the 23rd Psalm, then I will perform it. The gentleman agreed. So the great actor stood up on the stage and with all the dramatic flair he had, he quoted the 23rd Psalm. And when he finished, standing ovation. Everybody was on their feet. Everybody was applauding his performance. Then as agreed, the gentleman in the back also came up onto the stage. He stood there and he quoted from his memory, the 23rd Psalm. And when he finished, nobody stood. Nobody clapped. But if you looked at the faces of those in the audience, you could tell there wasn't a dry eye in the room. And then the great actor came back up on the stage. He said, this is exactly why I did not want to perform for you the 23rd Psalm. You see, I know the 23rd Psalm, but this gentleman, this gentleman knows the shepherd. And what makes all the difference on a day like today is whether or not you, my friend, know the shepherd. We have a good shepherd, a shepherd who wants us to return home. And today could be your day. I say this often. You're only one decision away from a totally different life. And that decision is to follow the good shepherd. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace and your presence in our lives. And we just now are reminded how good you are to us, how you seek us out, how you search for us, how how you come after us because you love us, because you want us, because you died for us. Your love is more intense and deeper than we can possibly begin to even understand or fathom. And we thank you for that. Thank you for laying down your life for us, the sheep, who without you would have no shepherd, would have no hope. We would be lost. And so we thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving us and for caring for us and doing everything a good shepherd does. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.